gentlemen, welcome on stage. <laughs> All right, David, welcome. Hi, welcome Thank on stage. You. You're looking forward to your talk. Good. I mean, many <laughs> of the people that I spoke of, they, they said that they come here only for dinosaurs. So you guys... So are no, no pressure either. No Rubbish. pressure yeah, whatsoever. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, I have to say that Matthew chose this topic uh, during, during a conversation, so I'm going to shoot the first question to <laughs> you, Matt. Uh, I just made a short definition of what a phenotype is and what a forbidden <laughs> phenotype is. And I think, first of all, before discussing the forbidden phenotypes, we have to pretty much discuss how nature works. So what are the basic rules of nature and evolution, and why is it that we see a certain logic in the development of all, of all organisms? So, who wants in, to start? In two, in two minutes. <laughs> okay. Yes. So, uh, the essential thing, I mean, for a start, biologists in particular aren't terribly interested in definitions of life. So we, we don't really work with one. You may learn one at school, mm -hmm. but at university level, we don't teach it and we don't discuss it. Particularly philosophers absolutely love talking about what is life and different definitions and all the rest of it. Um, NASA, their definition of life is a system which is capable of Darwinian evolution. That is that you have variation between individuals and that variation has some as a hereditary basis, so it can be transmitted to the next generation, and that there is differences in what are called fitness, so the ability to pass your genes on to the next generation. And to be honest, that's all you need. If you have that system, then over, as we can see, over three and a half billion years, we go from the first embryonic, um, even just molecules copying themselves to us meeting here. But... The issue, what looks like kind of an inevitability, that here we are sitting around in Sophia talking and humans are on the planet, that is actually a series of a combination of natural selection, but also a series of unfortunate or fortunate events which are outside of that sphere and are often cosmic in nature. So Dave's going to be talking about dinosaurs. We all know what happened to most of them. And that's nothing to do with natural selection, or rather it's to do with... A, an immense event of such a nature that the dinosaurs, apart from the birds, were not able to respond quickly enough to it, and they all died out, almost literally, overnight. So we've got this mixture of chance events and then this process of natural selection, which is filtering and changing things. And that, on our, in our planet, involves DNA. It doesn't have to involve DNA. There, other molecules may be available on other worlds if there are such things. Well, yeah, there are other I, worlds. But. I did notice that in your definition of life, you never mentioned that it, it, is, it, it should be organic or it should be a carbon-based form. So uh, the very fact that it can replicate and, uh, and there is an inheritance involved, that's a good working definition of white life. What, what life well, is. I think e even that definition would probably fit prions, though. Yeah, well, so well yeah, prions are... They vary, uh, there's inheritance of there's shape. There's proteins which will change the shape of other proteins, so that's what causes some neurodegenerative disease. So the information is not in the sequence of the amino acids in the protein, but it's in the shape of it. Right. And that will change mm -hmm. an ordinary prion into an unpleasant one. So that was what was behind, I mentioned, mad cow disease right. and variant Kreutzfeldt-Jakob, which is the version of it in humans that killed people in the UK in the 90s. And that's, that's not genetic. It's not genetic transmitted, but the prion, it's just this bit of protein, which is produced by a D, a DNA ultimately, but when it comes into contact with another shape, another shape protein, it, it alters it. Yeah. So it's kind of like a mould. So that's <coughs> kind of alive, but it needs the DNA to be able to do it. The, the protein on itself can't replicate itself. All right, so we have replication. Uh, obviously, we have genetics. Not in 100% of the cases uh, are, are involved, but all of these living things, they inhabit a certain type of environment, a physical environment. Uh, so what are the physical... Um, so to say, rules that are making life to be as, as we actually see it. Why, for example, we don't have Godzillas, uh, we don't have uh, <laughs> angels, uh, we don't have dragons. How did it happen? I mean, you did, did show quite clearly that we are all connected and we inherit you know, certain, certain traits. 
but why is there so, such a such a limitation when it comes to to, to evolution? Is that the physical environment yeah, well, that is having an effect? I, I think there's a, a couple of factors here. Firstly, it has to be physically possible to get to that thing. You know, there right. have to be evolutionary steps that one could take that would lead to a dragon. Say, you need to think about uh, the the chemistry of how it would breathe fire, how it would be protected from frying its own self with that fire as it breathed it. So you'd have to think of solutions to all of that. But then, even if that were all possible, there needs to be a path for evolution to decide that's a good idea, right? Yep. Um, that the environment is a big part of that because, of course, your fitness, your ability to, to, to pass on your genes and create the next generation, that is a function of your environment. You might be, have really great fitness in one environment and terrible yeah. fitness in another, which is why habitat change and habitat loss is actually causing a lot of extinction and a lot of problems because we're changing the environments that things have evolved to live in and therefore they don't do so well anymore. But there would need to be an environment in which it makes sense to be a dragon. It would need to be physically possible and it would need to be that in that environment a dragon can compete successfully against other forms of life and, and successfully lay its eggs, presumably, and brood them and do whatever it does to create new baby dr dragons. Mm -hmm. So um, let's think of some examples of such impossibilities, considering you know, the planet that we, that we actually live in. We have a certain type of gravity, we have a certain type of atmosphere. What is impossible on Earth? Some things, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there are, you know, physical constraints, which are physics constraints. Yeah. There are, you know, you can't get below a certain time. I, I do this like I mean this big. Obviously, you know, you, you can't have a functioning cell that's five atoms across because it wouldn't be a cell at that point. Um, you probably can't have animals that are much, much bigger than something like a blue whale, because although you actually get some benefits for moving in water at very large sizes, you also then start to reach certain constraints about things like how nerves function and how muscles function and support uh, and the ability to get air into your lungs and then for that to fuse and then to get around the body. So there are fundamental constraints, at least on this planet, linked to you know, the world as it is in basic physics. Again, on another planet that has lighter gravity or higher oxygen density or much, much higher air density might totally change how birds or other flying animals might be able to, or what shapes and creatures you might be able to come up with that would be effective. Uh, but with us, our atmosphere is really very thin indeed in the grand scheme of things, and that obviously makes it then pretty difficult for actually heavier than air organisms to fly. So are the dinosaurs, the biggest ones that we, that we know of, the limits? So the, the biggest terrestrial... There are huge problems with estimating accurately the size of dinosaurs from very fragmentary remains like these big animals. There are multiple credible estimates that put them in the realm of 70 tons, 7-0. So you're talking about 15, 20 elephants bolted together. Right. They are probably approaching the kind of sizes that you can realistically reach. Because again, at some point, you're going to have to have such a big animal that it weighs so much, its bones need to be so strong, that the legs are so wide that the legs just touch. And then you can't walk. Right. <laughs> And so these, are, these, these limitations are also a result of this genetic inheritance that we spoke yeah. of, uh, right? I mean, you can't, at a certain point, have an animal just evolve a different type of bone, for Christ's sake, right? I mean, I mean they do turn up, of course, but sure. when and under what circumstances and with what other constraints are in there, and, you know, the classic descent with modification, you're almost always changing an existing system a limited amount, and over enough generations you can produce, of course, incredibly weird things, otherwise we wouldn't sure. have as different things as insects and slugs and humans and jellyfish. But at the same time, you know, metal. Very, very, very few animals or plants have been able to incorporate many metals at all effectively into big systems like bones or skin, uh, just because of the chemistry of it. There's some little bits, they're mostly not very good. Mm. Uh, it looks like it might not be possible. It might be a forbidden phenotype. But yeah, if you could make bones out of metal, they'd be a lot stronger and a lot lighter. Sure. All right. <laughs> if, if you think of the, so that the problem Dave alluded to, if you imagine having a really long, thin whale, 
right? So, <laughs> like, a, you know, it, it, and it's going to be 200, 300 meters long. So, you've got the same mass, but it's now really, really thin, like a big snake. Now, you've got a problem with the speed with which your nerves conduct, send information, because they don't work, I mean, we talk about there being electricity in nerves. It's not working like electricity in a wire, right? It goes much, much slower. It's electrochemical. So already, even with a really big whale, when people worked out how fast nerve transmission was, they said, well, wait a minute, that means if I've got a blue whale and I pinch its tail, its brain knows about that a second later, right? So if you've got this really, really huge, long, thin whale, then you could start nibbling its tail if you're a predator, and it wouldn't have any idea. It wouldn't, right. it would have, it wouldn't be able to do anything. So there's those kind of constraints. You could fix this by changing how nerves function, but as James said, every step you take has to have an advantage, right? And that's one of the challenges people who don't agree with evolution often say, well, what's use half, what is the use of half a wing? You know, insects evolved wings in a particular way. They clearly couldn't fly immediately. Or birds learning, you know, evolving to fly. It wasn't initially flight. So what gave them an advantage? What, it, what use is half a wing? It's got to be, have a function because they don't suddenly kind of appear overnight. And the more you have to in your, you know, imagining strange animals, you have to undo things, undo the past, the less likely it is that that will ever happen. And that's why we don't have, you know, half, half a kilometre long whales that are very, very thin, because, yeah, you could yeah. eat their tail. <laughs> All right, well, well obviously, there, there are a few different types of selection going on here. So we, we have natural selection, we have sexual selection that we're going to cover uh, in a while, and uh, then we have artificial selection. So in terms of... Uh, natural selection, just on top of your minds, what are the weirdest forbidden phenotype type of creatures or features in animals that you can, that you can think of, of or, or that you studied? For example, like the weirdest dinosaur. What the weirdest one we have got or the weirdest ones we haven't? Uh, well, obviously the one you have. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know. I mean, Matthew's favorite, Stegosaurus, Stegosaurus and the Stegosaurus as a whole. Um, partly because the row of armor and plates is unusual in itself. I don't think there's any other animal that has something quite like that that's just along the top rather than going down the sides. Uh, but also because in Stegosaurus, at least, it's asymmetric. The left and they alternate plates left and right. It's not a row of pairs. Right. It's A, B, A, B, A, B, not 2, 2, 2. Uh -huh. And that's very weird. You know, the same way that James had his asymmetric worm. We sort of things like sponges and plants, when you get into animals, you don't have asymmetry. To have a partial asymmetry in an otherwise symmetrical animal is very odd indeed. It's very rare. Can you think of something? Uh, me? Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, you, did, yeah, you did show plenty yeah. of oddities. But. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think a pretty cool forbidden phenotype that we would think is forbidden, but which actually exists, is immortality. <laughs> Immortality. Yeah, yeah. So there's an animal called the immortal jellyfish. It's not literally immortal in the sci-fi sense. You know, I mean, you can eat it and it will die, right, if you want. Um, <laughs> but, but its probability of death, instead of sort of aging and having an increased probability of death the older it gets, its probability of death doesn't increase as it gets older. And it has this ability to just jettison its outer parts of its body and effectively become a larva again and just repeat its life cycle. But it's not technically reproduction what it's doing, it's just keeping itself and going back to being young and then growing old again for, for a second time or a third time. And in theory, this process could, could go on forever as long as it's not eaten or, or injured too badly or something like that. Right. Can we... Yeah, go ahead. Did you well, I mean, the only thing I can think of that is very weird but doesn't seem so to us uh, would be a kangaroo. Mm. So, as far as we know, I mean, most, I think most fossils we know, we know for, or an extinct animals we know from traces, is that true? <coughs> it used to be, maybe it's not true anymore. No, I don't think that's it's, true. You know, he, he, like, he likes to have bones. <laughs> but we old. know of an awful lot of trace fossils. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, you see uh, bits of you know, impact of feet or tails or whatever in bits of mud, and then you can try and interpret what's going on. As far as we know, the only animals that bound over long distances, rather than just hopping a little bit, are kangaroos and their relatives. And that is, it involves an extraordinary set of physics and tendons and organisation of muscles to have this kind of elastic movement that enables them to go at quite high speeds. 
And as far as we know, there has been nothing else in the fossil record that has done that. Now, maybe with some of uh, Dave's no, tyrannosaurs where no, T-Rex no. was hopping and <laughs> <laughs> using its tail in the same way. But that, that's what looks... Well, it still looks weird to us, but it's still... We're used to it. appears to be something that's really quite unusual. And the particular selective conditions uh, on Australasia you know, over 50 million years ago when the mammals, uh, the placental mammal, the uh, uh, marsupials are starting to really take control, that is going to have caused that particular uh, phenotype, which we don't, I don't think we have any idea of why they do it rather than running or any other, what normal animal did. Right. Well, movement is uh, an interesting thing. I mean, kangaroo is a peculiar example, but we can see that in the animal world, in the different domains, so to say, Animals are moving in pretty much the same way, right? I mean, flight is pretty much uh, uh, the same mechanics in the air. Uh, uh, swimming is pretty much the same mechanic, you know, across, across most, most species. Um, let's cover the topic of the wheel, because this is often given as a, uh, as a thought experiment. You know, why don't we have a wheel in nature? Because we consider the wheel to be extremely practical. I mean, this, you know, besides the fire, this changed our civilization pretty significantly. So how come we don't have wheels in nature and why? Well, my first answer is, have you, have you tried going mountaineering and then try doing that on a bike? No. Yeah, because wheels only really work on paths and ideally on roads. That's your, right. That, I think, is pretty much the first big problem with them. They, they work on some surfaces, mm -hmm. but on anything that's very irregular, they're very ineffective. But think of, a, think of that spider. So there's that spider that lives in the desert. In, it rolls <laughs> down hills. Latin yeah. America or somewhere. I can't remember yeah. where. But yeah, so that's quite a smooth kind of surface. And to escape from a predator, well, it doesn't have wheels, but it's got lots of legs, eight pairs of legs, and it can, three pairs, of, four pairs of legs, it can <laughs> gather them up and form a little ball, really. And then it rolls down the slope incredibly quickly. So there you go. You may not be able to live in the jungle or up a mountain, but there are lots of... I don't know, stretches of seashore, which if you were eating, if you were, you know, have the same niche as a wading bird, you could roll up and down there and, you know, get your, get your food that way. Why haven't we got birds with wheels rather than wings? Yeah, but that's not really a wheel, is it? Well, no, the, the, <laughs> no but I'm saying that there, is, there are environments yes, where and rotational useful, movement can yeah. help. And by extension, then, although there are lots of lumpy bits of the, of the world, there are also relatively flat and smooth bits where you might be able to live. True, but there's right. not that many, and they're often not oh, occupied by a large number of animals. There are a lot of, of birds. You yeah, know? true. OK, but, but of course, that's only the first problem, because then you've actually got to make it work. <laughs> so e even if we, you know, talking about James's thing of, you know, every step in between, and you kind of mentioned artificial selection, let, let's take one of um, Matthew's extreme... Ex well, not... One of Matthew's extreme examples, but, you know, talk about ridiculous sci-fi genetic engineering and we can make animals make wheels with biological components. You've still got to make it function. Like, there needs to be an axle and then there needs to be some kind of drive to make the wheel turn. Right. Yeah. And that's really quite difficult with muscle and bone or with mm, chitin yeah. if you're an invertebrate. All our muscles need to attach at both ends. That really doesn't work very well on a wheel. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Uh, yeah. yeah. Sounds painful at the least. It, 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 you, you get half a rotation and then that's kind <laughs> of the limit. Done, so, yeah. you know, even if you can skip, like, the steps, and that's obviously your first problem, is where is half a wheel going to be better than legs? Sure, Probably yeah. never. But e even, even if it stage. was, like, how could you even build it biologically? And the answer is I don't think you can. Yeah. And then it wouldn't be much use once you had it. Sure. Well, uh, there's a piece of uh, fiction here that I think suggests maybe a, a way that this could happen. Um, so there are these, these creatures in um, uh, the, his Dark Materials books by Philip Pullman, and they harvest fruits from trees which are basically wheel shapes and they put them on themselves and then they can use them as wheels. They can't drive them, they're not powered wheels, mm. but they presumably have an axle, they can put them on, and I can see how maybe the tree would benefit because these fruits are going to be harvested, eventually they'll break and they'll have to carry a spare wheel or something, they'll be jettisoned and a new plant will grow. The problem of a landscape, well that would actually be helpful, is another one, but there are actually really flat sort of salt deserts in South America, there are places where it could be beneficial. So 
I could imagine a very weird system where, um, I don't know, you've got some flat landscape like that, you've got a few lagoon-type areas, and you've got these creatures, and they might be using the wheels like we use a skateboard that's not powered. You know, they actually use their arms to get up speed, but then they can just freewheel on these long, flat areas. Um, as for the evolutionary steps, that's a bit more tricky, but you could imagine in such an environment a, a sort of wheel or at least ball-type seed might be pretty good just for being dispersed anyway on a flat surface, mm. and then yeah. something might think of it as a tool use, and, um, <laughs> uh, and then eventually they end up co-evolving. So th there's a kind of quiet, forced, but not impossible way it, it could happen, I think. Yeah, you, you could have kind of pseudo-wheels, because I can rotate my arms, right? Right. So I can, I could imagine having flippers and then doing that movement, which is not a wheel, but it's coming very, very close. And certainly in the water, that would be well, that's, one way of getting that's about. That's close to how wrasps swim <laughs> well, and seals, so, so that's sea lions, rather. Okay, so th then the question is, why haven't something more wheel-like or more you know, rotatory paddle-like with big things at the end. Because terrestrial, I suspect, it's way less efficient. And again, as soon as you come over across a rock, that stops working, yeah. and you just stand up and walk around it. But, but, but how about in different domains? For instance, in the air. I mean, we see that helicopters are an efficient way to, to go around. Do we have insects like that who evolved some sort of rotation like that? I think you mentioned something about that in an informal conversation well, before. I, I think I mentioned that it doesn't really exist. I mean, yeah. we, <laughs> we, so, so we, have, we have, for instance, the seeds of sycamores, which employ a helicopter-type autogyration system to float slowly to the ground instead of falling directly, which enables them to, to be caught by the wind and, and go further. So that's sort of the closest thing to a helicopter that I can think of in nature. But to really work, we have hummingbirds, right? They can hover, but they hover with wings. They don't hover with a rotary wing that rotates like a, 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 a a rotary wing of a helicopter does. So to get that, you've got to get over the problem of power, which Dave mentioned. Mm. You've got to power that rotor to make it useful. And also, it's the control surfaces are really complicated with helicopters. It's not good enough just to have something rotating. You need to be able to finally control the angle of those blades as they rotate. Yeah. So it's a pretty complicated bit of engineering that we only got right long mm. after we had fixed-wing aircraft. So I think that's well into the territory of forbidden phenotype. But they're, they're also not efficient, though. Helicopters are yeah. massively inefficient compared to aircraft. Sure. Yeah. And there's a reason that only small birds do it, and the main birds that do are hummingbirds and sunbirds that feed on nectar, so they're basically living on pure sugar, because they need the energy, because they're burning so much, to be able to hover. Right, mm. right. Or you, or you can think of uh, predatory animals uh, that can <coughs> not hover, but certainly be m far more manoeuvrable than a helicopter, something like a dragonfly, mm. which has spent you know, three years of its life eating things, getting mm. ready for this moment and developing those muscles and that nervous system, then is going to spend its, its life as an aerial insect, because they live under the water for those three years, as an aerial insect still consuming vast amounts of protein. But through ways of control that we really don't understand, they can perform maneuvers, you know, they can turn at the right angle. If you did that in a helicopter, it would just fall apart. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's also, one of the interesting things is that our thinking about machines, be they wheels or flying machines, we're always thinking about metal, whereas animals are made of stuff that is both rigid and flexible. So it's, there's a certain amount of flexibility to an extent in a, in a bone or in your body and its ability to coordinate itself, or if you're an insect, then in the, the, the chitin, which is the protein on the outside of it, which enables it to compress itself and change its shape as it's moving around. What do we think about a lighter-than-air animal? Is that forbidden yeah. phenotype? Yeah, it, I mean, it's, it's been done in sci-fi enough times, and there's a, you'd, you'd think... So there's a, there's a, sp a whole bunch of spiders do something called ballooning, so baby spiders, as a way of getting around, will just put up a very, very, very long, thin, fine bit of silk, and that's just enough to catch the air and lift them up. And they're found in the upper atmosphere. They can go huge numbers, huge distances like they this. They are spiders in the clouds. Yeah. 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 Okay. And they're, they're yeah. riding the electricity. It's electrostatic. It's not just the wind. Yeah. It's also this electrostatic movement, and that catches it, and zip, up they go. Yeah. Wow. But you'd think like that, you know, that we've already got things like water spiders that build basically a, a sphere of web, and okay, they're catching water, but you just need to have some kind of membrane in that as well, and then maybe that can warm up in the sun if it's dark, 
and you've got a hot air balloon, there's a, there's a pathway to that, yeah. at least potentially from things we already see spiders doing. I guess the problem is, once you're in the air, you've got the same problem jellyfish do, which is you're, you're now held by the currents. Right. You can't control where you go, yeah. and as spiders are predatory, if you can only go where the wind takes you, that might good. make it very hard to catch anything yeah. to eat. Yeah, right. So the diving spell, bell spider mm. brings down this this bubble of water, air. and it has, has uh, air. Sorry, it has a kind of uh, a little nest on a on a plant underwater, and then it can nip out, find some hapless uh, insect or crustacean that's walking past, and grab it and bring it back, and it, it eats it there. Whereas if you're doing the opposite and you're now floating around in the air. You yeah. can't manoeuvre it, right? And in fact, you're going to end up as being eaten by one of your fabulous alpine swifts that has yeah. been around Sophia right yeah, that's now. The, uh, yeah, Other stuff point. will eat you. Yeah, right. they're, ver they're very vulnerable at that point as well, yeah. I think. Yeah, so, you know, jellyfish rely on having their stinging cells to protect them. Yeah. Uh, I just want to get this question out of the way because I included it in the intro as an example of, uh, of uh, why species don't seem to be crossing in different domains. Like... Why we don't have like insects in, in water, and why don't we have fish in the air that is living there constantly, yeah. for example? I mean, so what, what, what in, happened? In, there? Insects in water is so you do have insects in, in fresh water. There are insects right. that will spend m virtually all or whole of their life in the in fresh water. What we don't have is any insects that li spell their whole life in the sea. That yeah yeah. So sea insects right like all arthropods, terrestrial arthropods. So that's crustaceans. So those little wood lice but also uh, myriapods so, uh, and spiders, they all came out of the sea around about 430 million years ago in different waves. So they come onto the land. It's probably the millipedes first. So the first uh, evidence of a millipede on land is from the United Kingdom, and it's little fossilized, fossilized bits of millipede shit. <laughs> so tiny little blobs that are found in, in rocks, and that proves that the millipedes came out of the land of the sea and start wandering about. So... They came out of the sea, so, but in some of them, it's potentially possible you could go back. That's clearly happened with mammals, right? We yeah. went back into the sea after a long sojourn on land. We've got whales and seals and all the rest of it. So why aren't there any insects that spend their whole life cycle in the sea? And sometimes people say, well, they don't like the salt, which could be true, because they can do it on water, but they, in fresh water, but not on sea. Maybe it's the salt, except... There are larvae, midge larvae, that will grow in horribly salty, bracky uh, bits of water, but that will then fly away when they hatch out. So it's not the salt. It's probably something much simpler, and that is the sea is full of crustaceans. And insects are, in fact, just a weird kind of crustacean. This is on your tree. It's one of the <laughs> discoveries that freaks people out, that insects are not a completely separate branch of arthropods. They're a kind of crustacean. And if they were to go back into the sea and start, you know, wandering around at the edge of the sea and living in there and eating bits of stuff that's in there, then a crab's just going to come along and uh, eat it up. And eat them all. Oh. So the sea's full, basically, as far as the insects are concerned. It's full of crustaceans and fish that are going to eat it. So there's no, there's no ecological space for them to find their way back. That's that, but we don't know. That's the kind of vague explanation there is. Right. Yeah, I... Well, yeah, I mean, I agree. <laughs> we, I mean, we have things that tie around the edge, right? We have flying fish, but they, they just fly in the air for a very short time to escape a predator. Their whole life cycle is in the sea, right? So that's, in a sense, the closest thing I can think of. And we, we also have, um, I discovered when I was reading about this, that there are some kind of skaters, like pond skaters, and they can be, temp they can be on salt water, actually, but they're not, it's, they, they don't dive under the water, they're just sitting sure. on it, you know? So things go onto the boundaries, and they try it out, but there has to be an evolutionary reason to go that step further. And if you're a flying fish, that the air is full of birds. And anyway, there's 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 not much food in the air in the deep ocean anyway, in the sort of distant oceans. And similarly, they're full of um, other predators and competitors the, uh, in the ocean for the uh, marine insects. And so, yeah. so there has to be a ecological point. niche where you yeah. to insert yourself in, and and it seems like. Every niche is busy right now. You know, yeah, not yeah. Many until the environment changes, until the, until next, the, environment until the changes, next asteroid right. comes along, or we are the asteroid, right, right. then things are going to change, and who knows what will happen. Sure. But, well, but I think what we're talking about, uh, sorry, David, but what we're talking about here is moving from one habitat to another absolutely radically different yes. habitat. So it's another example of that. And to, to move to a radically different habitat really needs a lot of steps to be.
be in place, yeah. and then yeah. there has to be a lot of reason for that. Yeah. Otherwise, if you do it rapidly and quickly, you'll just simply die. Yeah, That's... I think there's one exception to that, which I only discovered a couple of years ago. So, in general, as I said, the arthropods that came out of the sea haven't gone back in. The millipedes haven't reinvaded the sea. But there are mites. So mites are very closely related to spiders. You know, they're tiny little things. Sometimes they're bright red and you see them scuttling about. They, in general, they, they eat crap, they eat decaying matter, they eat leaf litter. There's bazillions of them in a, you know, in, a, in a square meter of leaf litter in a forest. And they also, we have now discovered, live at the bottom of the ocean. So presumably what must have happened is that there was some, at one point, living on a, a log or something, and, you know, eating a log, which then went into the sea and fell down, and somehow they survived. So I think it's about 30 species of mite that live down eating the, what they call marine snow, which yeah. is just all the stuff that floats down uh, to the bottom. And it's a pretty grim life down there. It's very cold. Uh, but they've been able to survive. So maybe sometimes, if you, are not, you don't have a very demanding physiology and you can survive in such circumstances, you can all of a sudden find yourself, oh, I'm down here, it's very dark, yeah. it's cold, but I'm eating, that's all right. By the way, it keeps fascinating me uh, how you biologists, just from a tiny piece of fossilized shit, can <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know, make a make make a whole story or, or discover a uh, you know a new a new species it keeps blowing my mind. Um, now, uh, obviously, we're speculating here. You know, what types of environments, uh, what types of creatures can we have in different environments? And it seems to me that biology is you, you have a tough job because there is not much predictability. There is it. I mean, uh, you did. Uh, I, I want you to tell the story. The, this, the this, analogy. This, this story, yeah. So, the analogy. so, why biology is hard. You know? Yeah. So this this is this is completely stolen from a colleague, and it's secondhand even from him. And I, it is frustrating me. I can't remember the name of his uh, acad his academic advisor in um, Princeton who told him this. But he said, this is why biology is hard. And he said, imagine a pool table or a snooker table, and you put three balls at the end, and you hit them down the end, and if you're even a terrible player, you can hit them fairly evenly and fairly straight, and they'll go down and hit the other end, and they'll bounce back, and it should bounce back about the same distance. And then put three cats there <laughs> and poke each one of them. You don't even know what the first one's going to do, right. let alone the second one. And you could do that for almost, you know, just Any moment creature. to moment. Yeah. be completely different um, for, for the same individuals, you know, even twins or clones of the same species, right. let yeah. alone what is anything else going to do. And then, again, in, you, know, you know, we've talked about entire ecosystems. Yeah. You know, well, that cat chases that mouse, which means that that lizard runs away, which then gets eaten by that hawk, and then its baby survives rather than dies and... Yeah, it's a, it's a mess. It's yeah. a, it's a mess yeah. of that, that's, what, that's what physicists generally discover. So physicists who get interested in, in biology, <laughs> they take their you know, kind of law-based, elegant view of the world and try to apply it to organisms. And For then, about five minutes. Yeah, and then they discover it's just absolutely horrible. Now, there are very few laws in biology. The laws we have are, in fact, those of physics. Right. And they tell us some really interesting things uh, that I think when I came in 2016, I talked about this, that if there are large predators on Enceladus, which is uh, the moon of Jupiter or Saturn, I forget, uh, it's Jupiter, and um, there is an ocean under there, we know it's, there's an ice on the top, and underneath there's an ocean. Now, if there are large predators which are moving fast, in that ocean, they are going to look like uh, something like a, an ichthyosaur, or a dolphin, or a shark, a tuna. or uh, a tuna, or an octopus moving fast away from you. They're going to have a, a streamlined shape. And the reason we have the, all those animals look the same, they're completely separate lineages, but it's natural selection and the requirement to move fast in water that is making them look like that. Now, if they're really small, they can be any old shape because the most yes. bizarre shapes available are possible and water it becomes like soup or thick syrup mm. when you're really tiny. But if you are large, of that you know, meter scale, then you've got to be that shape. Natural selection yeah. will make you that way. Yeah, so we can predict things, right? Yeah, and you're limited by Newtonian physics. You yeah, know, absolutely. Come, the, the, the other example which, uh, in fact, it was my, my colleague Brian Cox, who's a 
TV presenter, and he's, he's a physicist, but he did a whole series about, uh, about life and the physical constraints on it. And he worked out the limits of how big a, t- a tree... He said to me, how b- tall do you think a tree can grow? You know, what are the limits on it? And I said, well, I don't know. It's going to be something to do with the, the strength of the, the, the lignin, which is the, the protein that makes the tree and all the rest of it. He said, no, no, no. The limit is, in fact, the strength of a hydrogen bond. Because <laughs> water, you know, a tree needs to take water passively uh, through transpiration up from its roots up to its leaves, and then it, it, it goes out. And you can only have a column of water so high before, in fact, it's going to be ripped apart. Those hydrogen bonds will be ripped apart. So that is the limit. I think it's about 200 metres or something. We don't get trees that big for other reasons. But you couldn't have a 400 metre tall tree. It would not work. Unless it involved some kind of... Unless it had a pumping mechanism. Or some kind of something, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. it would have to to have a circulatory system. So it stopped being a tree, right? Right. Uh, But with our current plants, that is the absolute limit. And it's to do with the power of the hydrogen bond, which are holding the water molecule together. Just a, a fun fact on that. The biggest trees, which are the redwoods, actually, some of their water just um, condenses out of the air onto their leaves already. Just Their leaves are up in, up in the sky, I don't know how high, 100 metres up or something really high, and they, that water hasn't been got to the leaves okay. that way. It's condensed there, and, and they, they only grow tall in special kind of environments where the conditions are right to enable that to happen. If you plant them elsewhere, you know, as has been done, they're, they're not going to get so tall, apart from needing yeah. to take a very long time to get there as well. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's pretty obvious that, you know, natural selection does have, it has, has its limi- limitations, uh, you know, bounded mostly by the physical environment. Uh, but we also see that nature is not always as practical, or evolution is not uh, as practical as we tend, tend to think. We see extraordinary things which seem absurd. And they serve no function uh, whatsoever, uh, meaning that if we assume that there are two main reasons for creatures to exist, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to survive and procreate, um, yeah, what is the use of a feather? So, so here we come of, of, of the peacock, uh, for example, mm-hmm. the peacock tail. So here we come to the question of sexual, of sexual selection. Uh, what is the balance there that needs to be achieved in order for a creature... You know, because a, a peacock, it advertises itself from, from hundreds of meters. You know, a predator can see that thing. Does it want to get late so bad that it risks its life? I mean, what is yes, what is yes, on? yeah, is 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 the short answer. Have I you mean, met many men. Yeah. <laughs> Good uh, point. Yeah, no, but that that really is it because yeah, if you, if you if you do not mate, if you do not have offspring, your genes will not survive. Right. You know, it, it's the rule is pretty much that simple, and again, the incredible diversity of nature means you end up with phenomenal mating systems. Um, and pressures or that, that give you these bizarre results. And on the one hand, you have things like peacocks, yeah, that produce these massive trains and enormous displays, um, but makes them incredibly vulnerable to predation. Uh, and then on the other hand, you get these wonderful things called antichinus, which I imagine most people have not heard of. These little marsupials, sometimes called marsupial mice, though that's misnomer for a bunch of reasons. It's like, yay big plus a tail, and they would look a bit like a small rat. Uh, antichinus uh, in this system where the females require um, a very specific source of food from some fruits and nuts that are only available for a very, very narrow window in the year, just a couple of weeks. So they need to have their offspring in time so that they've got access to this food to produce the milk to rear those offspring. That means their window for mating is incredibly narrow. If you don't mate within about one week period, that's it. So, well, you just won't, yeah, the offspring will, will die. So this has now forced the males into a system where they basically have a sexual frenzy to try and mate in that one week. And so males basically pump themselves so incredibly full of testosterone that they just start to fall apart. Um, they stop grooming, um, they're completely covered in parasites and diseases because their immune system collapses, um, and they just run around and fight and screw, and that's all they do. <laughs> and you will find antichinus at the end of this period, like missing fur, missing legs, 
covered in ticks, and they just and they stop eating, and they just disintegrate. Like they, as an as an animal, they stop functioning biologically and collapse. Wow. But if you don't do that as an antikinus, yeah. there is no chance of you having sex, and so you are not surviving. Your your genes are not surviving to the next generation. It's like a fair price to have sex. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right? But but like that's what's happened. It's an average sat fr Saturday night in Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> or Wednesday. <laughs> Um, yeah, so you get these phenomenal systems evolve. By, by the way, just a, just a side question to clarify something. Why is it that only males in most, let's say, 95% of the cases that I know of are the ones doing this crazy thing? Um, I think ultimately it's, so th there's two functions. I mean, because we are risking our lives, yeah, yeah. you know? It's right. like we are the idiots here. That yeah. wanna... So th there's, there's, usually, there's usually two things. So the, the one argument which is also put forward, which is usually put forward is um, parental investment. You know, in, right. in a lot of systems, the mother is having big eggs or looking after the young or whatever that, that necessarily is, and the male isn't really, and therefore, if you imagine, you know, you, ha you have 100 units of energy, if there's enough units of energy to look after the offspring, uh, if say that's 30 units of female energy that they need, that means the males have got 30 units of energy that they can put into something else, be it growing a big display or fighting someone else or running around and being an anti kindness but the reason I think drives that which people overlook is because usually, whether it's internal or external fertilization, um, when it comes to this kind of thing, the females are sure of maternity. If you are fertilized, you are the parent. Right. Whereas as a male, um, you, know, you could have sex with 100 females and yeah. have no offspring because she, every one of those females mated with other males as well. Right. Whereas as a female, if you get pregnant or if you've laid eggs, following sex, or even if you release eggs into the water as a fish and all the males come along, yeah. those are your eggs. You know they're your offspring. They are worth investing in and looking after and rearing because they have your genes. Whereas for the males, maybe, maybe not. Right. We make no sense in nature. <laughs> I mean, I, I remember your colleague Steve Jones, he wrote some, uh, a book, something like that, like the Y chromosome in which he yeah, yeah. argues. It's like, what? We are not even needed, you know? It's no, no, well, <laughs> he, he predicted the Y chromosome was going to yeah, come. It's going to and it is getting yeah, yeah. smaller over time. Yeah, yeah. But he also points that the gene for murder is on the Y chromosome because the vast majority of murders are committed by men and therefore quite clearly... Yeah. <laughs> so his, he, that's not true, by the so, way. So he suggests that not only males will disappear, but with yeah. them all the crime will go away yeah. as well. It's no, like, it sounds like a good go. deal. Yeah. Ladies, you'll be living in paradise. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But, I mean, so the, the point about sexual selection, the, the argument underlying this is also, I mean, it's hard to prove, is that one of the biological definitions of male and female, which extends dependent, irrespective of how sex is determined, is that females produce what are called the macrogametes. They are generally bigger, and so they have, it for each you know, possible offspring, they have invested more than the male who's yeah. producing sperm, the microgametes, which are much, much smaller. Now, if you're, an ex if you're a fish, say, then the females are producing bazillions of eggs, so those differences are really quite small. But the, the idea is that in, uh, when sexual selection really starts taking off, is that there is something linked. The females start to choose between males on the basis of some aspect of their genetic makeup. And that is linked, in a way we often don't understand, to a particular phenotype, a particular expression. So birds are one of the best examples, and the peacock's tail. So Darwin said, the peacock's tail makes me sick, yeah. because he couldn't figure out how you had this bizarre tail, and yet they were doing, and get eat, potentially get eaten. So the, the argument is that, as well as having a gene for a bit of a, a bright, a bit of brightness on your feather, that's linked to some other characteristic that we may not be able to detect. The female, by picking up on the bright feather, is therefore increasing the fitness of her offspring. And then the whole thing starts to get uh, into a kind of runaway sexual selection, it's called. Yeah. But then you've got a limit, because there are predators who can also see you. And clearly, if your tail gets too large, or too long, or whatever, then you're going to get eaten. At that point, that's the limit of quite how long or bizarre your, your structure can be. And it'll be the predator's natural selection will then start operating on that. So you've got a balance of the two. 
and people have actually demonstrated this works. There is female choice in a, in a species of what's called a widow bird that has these long tails, and they... Uh, it was a very small study, but it still got published in a leading journal, and it's reasonably convincing. Uh, they chopped the tails off the males. They chopped them in half. And so they had males now with short tails. They, had, they took those half tails and put them onto some other males. So <laughs> males had super long tails. Mm -hmm. And then they did the right control. They chopped some tails off and then stuck them back on. So they had normal length male tails, but they had been operated upon. And they found that the males with the extra long tails actually had more nests, because these are males that have many females, uh, than the other two groups. So, and the males with the short tails did not do well at all, I'm afraid. So that suggests that there is a choice element of females choosing longer tails. Right. One would expect that if in nature you had a really, really ta long tail, you're going to get eaten. And yeah. the, the current length is the best that can, be, can happen. It, yeah, I mean, uh, related to that, you have to, uh, that kind of explains an answer to another question, which is you've got it, the peacock, say, with its ridiculously long tail, filling its niche in nature, somehow managed managing to survive and not be eaten despite having such a long tail. But you've got to explain why doesn't some other bird um, fill the niche of the peacock, eat similar food, but, be, but not do the stupid tail signaling thing, and therefore the peacock overall will just go extinct because something else is able to outcompete it by tetra signaling this st stupid sexual competition business. Well, that doesn't happen because it's a, what you call an honest signal, right? If yeah. a male peacock is able to have those feathers and still be alive to do any mating at all, then he's probably got many other properties that will enable the offspring, both male and female offspring, to be fitter and more successful. And so it injects this mechanism that helps them to stay fit and healthy, but only up to a point because, as Matthew has said, yeah, you get the limit and then, then it becomes detrimental overall. I mean, it, sexual selection is so bizarre that we often, if we see something we don't understand, we can't see a, 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 a natural selection explanation for it. Then you say, well, maybe it's sexual selection without actually necessarily having any evidence. So people have suggested that the stegosaurs' plates might be sexual selection. Or, for example, the, uh, the hammerhead shark, which has got this really weird, wide head. <laughs> Now, it may well be sexual selection, but uh, you know, my thing, as I talked in my first talk here, was about sense of smell. And the, the distance of the two nostrils on the hammerhead shark's head is sufficient for it to have a very, very acute ability to detect smell, because the signal from this nostril is coming much, much earlier than right. this nostril. So they can actually navigate the smell world under the sea, because fish smell, uh, perhaps more efficiently. So it may be a combination of some natural selection f f factor, you know, have a widespread nose, and then sexual selection driving that even more and making it particularly right. weird. Do you want to talk about sexual selection no, in dinosaurs? No, I, 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 was, I, was, well, <laughs> I, 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 I will in about 40 minutes. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I was, I was simply going to defend occasionally, um, I wouldn't necessarily myself, but certainly some people who... <laughs> You know, but this, I, I've heard that accusation of, oh, well, if you don't understand it, no, you say it's okay. sexual selection. And while I do see where that's coming from, at the same time, I'd say, we know just how good at natural selection yeah. is at purging anything weird yeah. and that isn't detrimental. And if you are a fish that's grown a balloon on the top of your head, which we absolutely know will stuff your hydrodynamics and make you slow and inefficient and vulnerable to predators, it is probably there for a very good reason. And boy, is sex... Mm the reason, yeah. and I think actually peacocks <laughs> kind of demonstrate that in the sense that sexual selection can absolutely completely overrule natural, natural selection, selection in a way that we'd normally think of yeah. it. Um, that, that really is what it does. Mm. Uh, a lot of the time, again, uh, just as an aside, I'd also like to mention that the two things are not necessarily separate. Uh, my favorite example of this is elephants. We know that you know African elephants, the male bulls, you know, they will fight each other to the death with their tusks. And we know that females prefer bulls with larger tusks. So there is sexual selection driving body size and tusk size. But elephants use their tusks to fight off lions and uproot trees and right. strip yeah. bark yeah. and yeah. dig holes in the ground for water. They're under sexual selection and natural selection. Yeah. Right. And then that's when it gets really complicated. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right, uh, now that we established that being male was a disease, let's <laughs> move to, to humanity itself. Uh, oh. <laughs> now, the topic that I, uh, that, that I want to cover real quickly is artificial selection. Now, mm -hmm. we are saying that we have created all types of crazy animals. You know, that if you just look at the dog breeds, it's insane. Mm -hmm. And frankly, sad. You know, for mo for, for most of the dogs, you did spoke uh, about you did speak about you know genetic manipulation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as well. Uh, shall we assume then that when it comes to forbidden phenotypes, we can pretty much create whatever we want? Well, apart from things we can't create. Then sure. we, yeah. yeah. I mean, artificial selection could do the most bizarre things. Uh, yeah. So going, you know, there, there are examples of, of chickens with 20 meter long tails, right? So that's just impossible. But if you're a collector or a pigeon fancier or a chicken fancier, you can make one of these things by simply doing selective breeding. And selective breeding, the evidence from selective breeding in the 18th century is how we came to understand the basics of genetics right. that led, yeah. so that gave the insight that actually we can change this, we can manipulate it, and was used by Darwin in particular. Okay. There's an awful lot about pigeon breeders and pigeon fancies in the origin of species, because uh, he talked to a lot of people who could do this, and this was his model. So within those limits of the natural world, and if you were then to let one of these things go, the, the natural selection, then we can do pretty much anything. Uh, to uh, many of the animals we've tried to... Although cats, you know, cats are kind of... Uh, of they, course, there's cats. something. I mean, there is an argument about this. So some people say, yeah, well, we haven't tried. Okay? Yeah. So we have tried with dogs because dogs look the way they were. They do firstly for hunting reasons or, you know, work, they were working dogs. And they're then useful. They're useful and they're nice. They're useful. And then in the 19th century, then it became, you know, people became interested in doing right. it for fun. So maybe we haven't tried much with cats. Other people say, no, there's not sufficient genetic variability in cats. I think that's probably rubbish. Uh, I think it is more likely that we just haven't tried enough yet. So you have very few varieties and sizes and all the rest of it. Let's not play with size. I mean, I, I forgot who said it, but if a cat is your size, it's definitely going to kill you. It doesn't <laughs> yeah, well, matter if you... Yeah, they're, they're, they're called large cats. Like, they, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. I mean, people who have large cats at home, yeah. you know, eye pumas or whatever, you know what's going to happen in the end. They're going to turn on you. So don't do it, folks. <laughs> it's a bad idea. All right. Uh, more of a, at the end of the discussion, on, or, or on a more philosophical note, probably, or, it's, it's, it, or it could be part of a, like a general discussion of uh, what I think Richard Dawkins calls that, the extended phenotype. I have no idea whether he coined the term or, or not. Mm -hmm. But human technology. Uh, and, you know, obviously human ingenuity. Uh, these are not things that you see commonly in nature. I mean, we are extremely weird when it comes to that. Uh, can we consider the fact that we actually invented planes and we, we sort of invented the, the forbidden phenotype all over the place, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, can, we, can we consider our use or creation of technology as, a, as a something, something that evolution actually did to us? Or is it a quirk of evolution? Is it something that is so extremely p peculiar that intelligence itself can be considered the forbidden phenotype? phenotype? Don't know. Well, <laughs> I don't think intelligence is a forbidden phenotype. I mean, there's yeah. lots of in intelligent animals besides uh, human beings. Um, and there's lots of tool use in intelligent animals other than human beings. So um, uh, it completely makes sense that this is a way to access what would otherwise be a forbidden phenotype because it kind of relaxes. If we just come back to the, the two original things, it had to be possible. There had to be a point. The artificial selection part of it that Matthew was just speaking about, there doesn't have to be a point anymore so that constraint is taken away we just have to decide you know let's create a, a silly cat maybe we can do it and then the the possible part of it is relaxed with technology. Um, whether you still consider that a forbidden phenotype or cheating is now about <laughs> now, now semantics really. Right. Yeah I guess the other thing is well of course yes we do have all this stuff but uh, Petco how does your iPad work? I mean, not I press things, but how does it actually work, right? If I give you uh, a load of stuff, can you make one? No. No, no neither can I. I mean, it's basically magic, right? So right. A lot of, but on the other hand, if I gave you a couple of bits of rock and said, make me a stone axe, you'd 
hurt I'll, your hands, but eventually, after I'll several out, months, yeah. you'd come up with something. So the, some technology is available to us easily. Other technology, we rely on society to create it for us. And it's only mm -hmm. inherited in the sense that we can, we've been shown how to use it and it's still around. You know. If uh, the next uh, great sunstorm wipes out all electromagnetic data, uh, then we're going to go back to a rather different world, you know, and we're going to have a hard time of recreating everything that we've lost. So it, it, it's really very fragile, right. I think, uh, the technology we've acquired and developed and uh, less permanent in that respect than uh, an, an adaptation, a biological adaptation. So, so fundamentally, the ability to use tools in humans and, let's say... You know, some some sort of an ape, I think, orangutans. Or crows, right? Crows yeah. will make tools to make tools. Yeah. So if you give them little bits of, of metal, they can twist it round in order to make something else that they can turn into a hook yeah. that they can then use to get some food. So that, I mean, that's pretty meta. That's that's quite amazing. Yeah. You know, that that's showing a level of foresight and thinking, whatever that is, that can imagine a series of steps mm. and then work out how to do it. And they haven't been trained to do it. It's not natural. They don't. Well, they do make tools in the wild. This is an experimental situation, right? Yeah. So they're then, you know, they are then thinking in that way. It's really quite amazing. Right. So high intelligence is not really a forbidden phenotype. It's something that we, no. we, we, we commonly see. And high intelligence, even in humans, is... Yeah, is I mean, I, th I think the, the problem we have is obviously understanding just how intelligent animals are yeah. because, you know, dolphins don't have a communication system like us at all. There's some, certainly some hints that there is, you know, in the ballpark of higher apes, but then how do you Measure them. get them to communicate? Yeah. Uh, you know, how can they show it to us? And certainly, you know, dolphins are tool users mm. uh, and, and intelligent ones. There's a lovely one, uh, there's a group of dolphins that use sponges... Uh, on the end of their beak, or beak nose, they'll grab a sponge and then use it when they trawl through sand trying to find buried rays. And by having that on there, they stop wearing their nose down. So it's really quite nice. But what we've also found is they'll, they'll, they'll drop the sponge when there's other dolphins around because they don't want them to know that they've learned how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can rub your nose in the sand, <laughs> but I, I don't want you to know. Dolphins are plowing. They can invent agriculture at some point. Well, right, but, the, but it's this, you know, but again, it's this, right, it's got a theory of mind. It understands that if that dolphin sees me, it will do what I do and mm. I don't want it to. That's pretty complicated and abstract <laughs> chain yeah. of thought yeah. for it to have. But... Yeah, they can't just tell us, which would make yeah. life a lot easier. They need that because they're very social organisms. Well, so right. Got a, it's always going to be the... It's coming back to what you were saying earlier, Petco. It's the environment. It's the nat it, that is what is shaping everything. And the ecological niche you're in is going to determine the kind of things you can do, and you'll find a, a pathway to surviving, and it might be as an individual, or it might be as a group, and humans are incredibly social. That's why we've got the technology, because we have a society. And if any one of us had to do anything, apart from bash two rocks together on our own, we'd have a very hard time. As a group, you can have immense success. Right. I think that's a nice message to... Uh we can, we, can, we can leave it here. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for this discussion. Thank you. Gentlemen, okay. applause. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay.